Welcome to the Shifted Podcast and Video Series. Each week, we talk to classroom teachers about how their teaching and learning has shifted since the onset of the global pandemic. We delve into classroom practices, daily routines, structures, and schedules, digital tips, tools, and tricks that you can use in your classroom right away. Welcome to the Shifted Podcast and Video Series, Episode 4. My name is John Hamlin. I work with the Greater Victoria School District in beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, the capital of our province. We're beaming to you from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt Nation, upon whose land we live, we learn, and do our work. In episode four, we're connecting with Eric Simonson from Oak Bay High School. Eric has taken his tech skills to the next level and become a full-fledged content producer in the remote learning environment. During this episode, Eric will be taking us behind the scenes of his production and workflow that he's used to create engaging online learning modules for his students in the secondary physics realm. Now, Eric has certainly leveled up his digital skills and practice over the course of the remote learning period. This is definitely what I consider to be more on the advanced level and the the advanced end of the spectrum. If you're listening to this episode on one of our audio podcast platforms, Consider checking out the video as well, because Eric will be demonstrating, walking us through a number of his lesson plans and uh, showing us how he sets up um, a number of digital tools that he uses in his repertoire. Eric will also be sharing a number of his uh, lesson plans and exemplars that we will link in the show notes at the bottom of this episode. If you have questions, comments, or feedback, you can check out our Anchor FM link at anchor.fm slash shift dash ed. And on that site, you can leave us a voice message, send us a note. Um, Feel free to provide any comments, feedback, or perspectives you'd like to be aired in an upcoming episode. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy episode four. Take care. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, This morning, we're chatting with Eric Simonson from Oak Bay High School. And this Zoom conversation is beaming to you from the land of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt Nation, upon whose lands we live, we work, we Zoom, and we uh, connect. And I'm really pleased to connect with Eric this morning, Eric. If you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about your your teaching area, your expertise, and um, what uh, the last few months have been looking like for you in this remote learning hybrid landscape. Okay, great. Uh, So I teach primarily physics at Oak Bay Secondary. Uh, Of course, science as well, junior science. The last couple of years, I've only been teaching physics 11 and 12. Next year, I've got grade nines. So awesome. Um, And I've been teaching for 25 years. I've been at Oak Bay for 21. A little stint over in Richmond before that. But yeah, most of my career has been been here in Victoria. That's awesome. So um, really, you know, in terms of somebody who's a real specialist in, a, in an area, that definitely sounds like <laughs> that sounds like you. And I guess keep you having the grade nines come in just keeps you on your toes a little. Yeah, bit. absolutely. Classroom yeah, it's good. And yeah, it's good to, good to stay, <laughs> stay connected to the uh, to the you know the young folks. Um, yeah, I've often had you know at least one junior science class, um, and of course in the in the early years, many many more than that, but. Um, mainly mainly physics and for for the uh period of time from spring break on um i was mostly planning and implementing lessons for physics 11. i'm really fortunate at oak bay we have two full-time physics teachers Uh, we're teaching 14 blocks between us of physics in a linear system so we were able to at the beginning of the, the sort of covid times we were able to split the 11s and 12s and take primary responsibility um, for one subject. So I was doing all the physics 11, essentially teaching nine classes, but of course, online, it -hmm. it didn't matter. Uh, And my colleague, Al Carmichael, was doing the physics 12s. Of course, we did all our planning together and um, any sort of communication with our students. It was our own classes, tutoring and helping kids prepare for tests and that. All the marking we did, of course, our own classes but the actual creation of the online lessons we we split that work so that's pretty unusual we were very lucky to be able to do that and i I know i have colleagues that had four or five preps 
and they were they were trying to manage you know getting out a couple of lessons a week um and and it was it was a lot of work yeah for sure it definitely seems like a, a strategy to keep things manageable um so if looking at your your practice and whatever digital tools you're using pre spring break and post spring break what has changed or what hasn't changed maybe you already had stuff in place but what what did the pre and post um world look like for you from a perspective of digital tools specifically right yeah i, I would say i was probably an in-betweener at the beginning of of all of this i i definitely had dabbled with google classroom for example um for the last few years been doing some labs based in classroom which has been great but i have not been using it as a daily platform for delivering materials or lessons or so that was a big a big switch i think pretty much everyone at at oak bay jumped into the classroom and, and, and environment and really um flew with it so some people were starting fresh others have been using classroom for many years so we had some great local resources to to tap into and get us all going so that was that was a big learning curve i'm still i'm still learning a lot about classroom and then uh, supplemental um, materials we were using uh, google forms for some of our assessment go formative great website they were super helpful offering their uh, materials for free as as did many mm -hmm. web services around the world um, uh, you know tur turned off their subscription services which was really cool some simulation um, on uh, websites from the University of Colorado. They have a website in the physics world called FET, which is a, a, a great set of JavaScript and HTML uh, simulators for doing labs. So it's far from ideal uh, doing a, a lab over, you know, over the internet, but we were able to get the kids to collect some simple data sets and, and, and do the things that we would normally do in science, graphing and, and, and creating, um, relationship looking for relationships so that was great and yeah and then tying it all together for me the way I chose to go about it was to do um, screencasting and and to to take my what I would normally stand in front of the kids and say in class and a little bit of handwritten notes on my tablet I I, I put that together along with video clips and animations simulations from different sites and uh, and was able to piece that together using screencasting software so i had to learn i had to learn how to do that and all of the technical glitches that go along with it what screen so, uh, casting software did you land on because i know there's quite a few options out there yeah we tried a few in our in our science department i ended up um getting a, a one-year subscription it was really cheap to screencast um i found it kind of made sense to me their their base program which is free works great too but a lot of the free screencasting apps are limited in time and in hindsight i think i probably could have could have used one of the free ones and just made a series of five minute lessons uh, one of the mistakes i made was to create a single lesson with too many I think I shared one with you that's half an hour long. That's far too long. <laughs> and I know some teachers out there, if you're listening to this, you'll be laughing at me, but it, it, you know, it's hard enough for an adult to watch a half an hour long video, um, especially when it's a boring old physics teacher talking for half an hour. But that's what happened. I just, I, I tried to, to cram too much into one video. So a lot, yeah, a lot of the screencasting apps, they have a free service. And uh, I think Screencastify, which is a Google app or a, like an extension you can add to, to Chrome, the browser, which is great. Cause then you just have a button on your, on your button bar there, you click it and you can go, you can record and do some simple screencasting there. The other thing I wanted to do was to be able to have uh, multiple feeds. So for example, two video cameras or um, a video from one computer and say my hand writing from my tablet. So I was mixing signals from a PC and a Mac mm -hmm. and Screencast-O-Matic seemed to be able to handle that uh, with my limited technical skills. I was able to figure that out. They're certainly not perfect, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, yeah, it's an intriguing angle because that definitely uh, is a little more complicated than just the standard 
screen capture software. So, yeah, yeah, I I, I decided at the beginning that um, I wanted to have uh, my floating head. You've seen this in a lot of YouTube videos or whatever. The little head talking in the corner. A lot of people who screencast do this, and it personally, this is just my own experience. I've always liked that to be able to see the person's face that that is talking. And, and I decided, okay, I want to do that in my videos, but it turned out not to be very easy when I first started. Um, my first lesson that I screencasted is very, very bad. Uh, there's little or no editing. <laughs> it's just terrible. And then my second one, I, I tried two cameras and that was almost impossible to edit. So when I, when I settled on Screencast-O-Matic, uh, I was able to use my tablet we use um primarily the you know there's this the school tablets and then in the science department we have a couple of the microsoft surface pro fours which are, are great for um capturing you know text and doing diagrams and stuff so i was able to, i was able to get that done and i think over the couple of months my my lessons improved a bit uh far from perfect i would I would actually like to continue to do this on, you know, in the fall, much, much fewer. I mean, we're going to get to see the kids at least a little bit in person in the schools, which is great. Um, but I'll probably continue to do a little bit of screencasting as well. And hopefully it'll just keep getting better. Yeah. Well, that, and that's an interesting, you raised those, those points about sort of what, what, what you've learned about this process along the way, because that's part of the conversation I've been having with folks too, to help, our colleagues avoid some of the same pitfalls that we've may, perhaps have encountered along this this road. Yeah. What other things would you potentially do differently if you were if you were sharing this with uh, another physics teacher at a different school? What would you do differently um, in September if you had to redo this process over again? So uh, I think there's a, there's there's a few things. First, um, I would, as I mentioned earlier, I would shorten my lessons if you want to call them that the the video portion along with along with the video i would also send out written material and other web resources for the kids to look at and i, and I sent you some links we can talk about that later if if there's time um, but as far as the screen casting piece goes yeah try to try to make that shorter and f for me personally the, the where i was headed and where i would like to explore more is is a, a script prepared ahead of time <clears throat> where basically each line of the script is a piece of video or a piece that you record uh, separately and then you stitch them together later and just making it very concise and taking out any pauses, uh, any hum, you know, what I'm doing right now, that awkward <laughs> looking for the next word. Uh, you can, you can edit those out really easily once you have the technical know-how and uh, really shorten your videos up. And also one thing I, I learned was don't put um, specific details in your lessons or your videos, uh, you know, about that particular class or week, or you can add that later to your written instructions on classroom, or you can make a separate video. But thinking ahead, if I wanted to reuse a lesson, say on waves, like the one I sent you was one of my waves lessons from physics 11, it, if I go back and, and look at it right now, I probably have said things that are specific to the, the COVID era, specific to my classes from this past year. So I wouldn't really be able, I would have to do some more editing. So try to think of it like if you were a YouTuber and you were producing a, a, you know, a product that you could put out there and people could watch it for years on end, that's probably gonna make it more concise, more to the point, and those other details you know, personal stuff or weather comments on the weather. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Things that are attached to the calendar. Um, you know, just leave that out and put that somewhere else. And that, that can help, I think. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. So would you mind walking us through your waves um, activity that you shared with me? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I can show you the, the, the sort of three pieces that I tried to send out each week. Um, one, one of our, our big struggles, and I'm sure this was at all the schools globally, I suppose, was uh, the reduced amount of time to deliver uh, our curriculum. And senior physics, you know, there's, there's, a lot of content it is pretty content heavy and uh it was 
it was hard to get through um, all of that. Well, we didn't, you know, we had to make decisions. So I think even before I show you uh, kind of a sample lesson, I'd say what, what preceded that was a lot of planning um, with my colleague, Al, who also teaches physics. But broader than that, the science department at Oak Bay, we um, were maybe a little too close. We, we you know, we, you think of like really high performing teams around the school district. And I'm pretty proud of what what the science department has. We're, we're tight. There's 15 of us. And I would say on a daily basis, probably 10 or 12 of us are communicating, uh, mostly via chat um, or email. And that continued right through the time when we were all at home. We were, we were texting one another continually um, and just helping, just helping each other out, figuring out the technology, the new applications that we were using. It was great. So that came first. And then what I, what I tried to do each week was to send out, uh, I guess what you would call the lecture part, the, the part where I'm talking and I'm using materials from other websites and that. And then I would send out uh, a print. It was all through Google. So it was a Google Doc. I, I used Google Docs. Other teachers use slides. Um, the nice thing about a Google Doc is you can paste things in there like color photos or, or even uh, animated GIFs, which are useful in, um, or GIFs, if you prefer. Uh, in, in physics, those are really great because you can have like a, you know, a motion that is repeated yeah. and you can just paste that right in there and the kids will see that. And then the third bit was I would, I would create a curated list of other resources on the internet for those kids that had time. So at the beginning of all this, when we came back from spring break, I made it really clear to the kids that they would, they would only have maybe a couple hours a week of work to do, you know, to get through their, their mark would, would stay basically the same as it was pre spring break. Remember we're a linear school. So we had done 75% of the curriculum already. And, um, and that, that was true. The kids that participated, their marks usually were either the same or maybe even went up by one or 2%. So that they could relax a little bit on that. And um, I, I said to them, you know, if you're going into physics 12 or if you're going into the sciences, if you're, gonna, if you're interested, if you're just interested in physics, here's some extra stuff to do. And then I had a long list of, uh, you know, YouTube videos or web website simulations where they could go and spend some time and and just go deeper mm. because that we you know we lost some of that mm-hmm. with, with the time uh, the time crunch so uh how do i go about doing this do i so this this is kind of like your uh piece of paper that you'd snap into your three ring binder this is you know kind of the outline for the day if you like so i would <clears throat> each lesson would have uh, some goals now this is part two of a lesson so it might not make sense I had to spread this out over over two different uh, lessons because wa- there's a lot of wave phenomena this was part two so in particular looking at interference and the Doppler effect um, and then just some notes so definitions and here's where I would I would go and scour the internet and get all sorts of great images um, yeah this so all of this would be talked about in the lesson portion but this just gives them another place to go and if they're um if they're interested or if they like to go back and study these things before a test they have the notes here as well it's a little quicker file there as you mentioned yeah Yeah. so this is great it it might not be useful in in other subjects but in physics there's often um repetitive motion or there's something you want to show the kids over and over so it sinks in a little better so this this was um you know, these were some images. I did uh, reference these as well. I try, when I, when I uh, was trying to model good behavior to my students, I would often tell them, you know, this image is blatantly plagiarized, but I will add, a, um, you know, a, a connection to it, a link to it later on. And I would add that into the, into the notes as I went along. But yeah, this, this is just a Google image search. So this is all sorts. This is the Doppler effect an ambulance going by that person. Mm. Um, homework, we, another really great thing in, in, in um, I know in physics and chemistry, there were some free textbooks that were essentially donated for the, for the COVID times. And, um, and, and we use that. This particular lesson, I didn't ask the kids to go 
um, well, it says read the text if you have time. Other, other homework would be go to the textbook and try these problems and then I would, I would hand write a solution guide on my tablet and, and post that. So if they were practicing problems or something. This was, um, just didn't fit here. So, and then I would, I would always tell them at the end what the next, what was gonna happen in the next class. So that, that's kind of, you know, the one piece. And then along with that, the resources. Mm. So this would be a unit, in the entire WAVES unit. So I wouldn't send this out every week. It's just too overwhelming. Yeah. What I would do is I would add to it. So generally I was touching base with the kids, uh, sending out a lesson twice per week. Mm. That was just what we decided together at the beginning. And, um, and this waves unit took mm. place over a few weeks. So this, this is just a list of videos about sound and light and waves. And I tried to go through each of these videos ahead of time and just highlight things that they might want to look at. Some of these videos are way off. I mean, they're loosely related to, to waves, but um, they're certainly not things that would be covered on a physics 11 test. So I, I, I made sure to say that in there. I like, uh, I like your humor you've interjected in the <laughs> descriptions there. <laughs> you know, when kids aren't, aren't present with you face to face, that's a big Yeah, problem. that was actually one of, one of my biggest struggles. Um, you know, in the, in the classroom, I like to, yeah, I guess I'm a bit of a joker. I mean, I think that my colleagues would agree with me there. I like to have fun in the classroom and uh, go off on strange tangents and, and, and those kind of things. And this is, you know, this didn't lend itself to that. When you're sitting in front of a, a microphone and a, you know, laptop recording a lesson, it's just, it's just not the same. So I was, I, I felt like my lessons were a little bit stiff and didn't have the usual humor that I would like to have. So that was a, that was a disadvantage. I think, you know, having a, a live audience, I, I guess I'm, a little bit of an extrovert that way. It's hard when the camera doesn't laugh at your jokes. Just <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, it's funny. <clears throat> so that was that was um, that was useful. I had some kids comment that they they liked that. Again, this was only if they had time. So this would not contain materials that would be on you know the test or uh, on any assessment. It may it may help with that a little bit. Uh, couldn't hurt, but. You know, I wasn't taking any any information from there uh, for the summative assessments. And this is the the um, screen. Oh, that's a good frame to stop on there. Uh, this is just just the beginning of a uh, screencast. So this is the one I sent you. And if you want to later uh, on your own time, you can you can watch through it again. Way too long. Um, some old video from the 1940s, 1940s yep. So I was, I was taking a, a video from, from websites. Here's a simulation. Is this showing up on your end, John? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This so this, water, yeah. We can change how fast the water is dripping out of there, the frequency, hmm. all that fun stuff. But what about... So uh, I was able to hear, I was able to combined together. There's my little talking head in the corner. Yeah. Um, and then th this is a simulation from the University of Colorado Physics Department. And, and the nice thing about these simulators is that you can show different examples. So later on in the video, I switch. Right now I'm looking at water. Um, and this makes a bit more sense live, of course, because you can show them this in real water. So there's, I put a clip later on in this video of a pond, someone do, demonstrating this in a pond of water, and then sound waves, how particles closer together, but you have a region where the amplitude is high, that's a volume. So, so again, just using their, their tools, they have great little graphing, there's this little um, pressure detector you know, digital detector that you can put over top of the waves and show how the pressure changes over time. And so you can relate sound and light and water waves and show the similarities and differences. This is a, a green light laser. Um, there's, this is from a different website where they're talking about speakers and how you get loud spots and 
quiet spots, even at a rock concert. So there's a little clip of a, of a rock concert in here. So really just using, here's the little clip from um, uh, Veritasium, a, YouTube, a YouTuber from uh, Eastern Canada, Derek. He's 3 million subscribers or something. So it's cool. You can pull in materials there and, and, uh, and use that along with some of the clip art that I put in my notes as well. So I'm just talking over this. I'm just kind of describing it. Mm -hmm. Another simulator here showing how waves can add together um, and so on. Again, far too long. And, and uh, I should say that this was one of the last, this was in the last week um, in, in May. So we were just wrapping up and, and things, <laughs> things got way too, <laughs> way too compressed. You know, we were trying to, to uh, cram in just you know too much material which was not good and I think some of the students for sure they um, probably tuned out a little bit during this half an hour video so this was the second big piece uh, of this video should have been in a separate video but the Doppler effect so again I was able to take these are uh, if I press play these are these are moving hmm. And that background is something you did just from another video with the background alone. Sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, that the video, the background with the, the circular waves and whatnot, that's from a, a video you found online somewhere? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so some of these are from, and, and this would be in that list that I sent out to the students uh, on the bottom, bottom of the last page. There's all the simulators that I used. So I linked, if they wanted to go and play around, because sometimes it, it's just, way better if you can if you can move the dials and uh, change the settings yourself um, and I encourage that uh, this particular scene what I paused at right now is from another from a youtuber um, who does it, it's called flipped classroom and and he does all sorts of really great physics videos and the idea it, it, as the name implies is that you know the students would watch this prior to coming into the classroom and then they would do do labs um, where they would actually be measuring these things in in class and that's one of the directions we're hoping to go in the fall um, is to do more you know of the flipped classroom we're only going to see the kids for a, about half time approximately uh, depending on which school you're at again oak bay uh, we we're, we're looking at switching to semesters mm -hmm. um, from, you know, we've been linear for many years now, so that'll be a big switch uh, just so that we can concentrate on four classes at a time. Anyways, we're hoping to, to um, use some of the skills we've developed over the last couple of months to be able to do a little bit of classroom flipping and, and send some of the material out uh, online and then use our time in class for, you know, really the fun stuff, the labs and, and, and measurements and, and those kind of activities. Hmm. So you, you think our biggest, our biggest thing is going to be time again, you know, we're, we're going to have to chop um, content. It's bound to happen. Uh, what I'm hoping in the fall, I'm hoping actually we'll, we'll just be able to go deep into fewer areas, which is, you know, that's had a lot of edge more, um, very successful education systems around the world. You know, they just have fewer outcomes and they just go deeper. Yeah. And, uh, and that's kind of hoping that that's going to be the pro um, of having smaller classes in the, in the fall. Yeah. So you mentioned do. the 30 minutes was too long for that, the lesson. Have you kind of determined what the sweet spot is for lesson length or? Um... Um, I guess it depends on what's in um, what's in the lesson. The, the, the one thing this, this particular long video has, it does have not, not really interaction, but it does have some simulations and some videos that are a bit more, you know, easier to digest for a teenage brain. The talking head would not work for more than a few minutes, I think. Um, and occasionally I would go to my pen, I would use my tablet and deliver notes in the old school, mm. you know, the old way. That is, that's deadly. I, I think, you know, minutes of, of lecturing five or 10 minutes would be, would be long enough. If you're embedding other materials in your screencast, I'm guessing 15, 15 minutes, maybe 20 on the outside would be where I would want to, where I, it also depends how many of these that you're, that you're asking the kids to watch each week. 
Uh, some teachers were doing one lesson a week, just a little bit long. Um, or if the kids were doing a project or something like that, they wouldn't necessarily be having lessons. They would just be guiding the students. Um, so yeah, it depends, depends a lot on the, on the, on the subject as well. Yeah. I know in, in English and socials where you're, where the kids are writing, uh, that's going to take a lot more time to, to go through that with them. So zoom meetings, uh, debates, you know, that kind of stuff would be really beneficial. Whereas on a, a content heavy, subject like physics where you have to deliver all stuff um this is this is not a bad way of doing it I, I just think it should be a little shorter or maybe chunked better yeah, yeah. makes sense um so uh we're kind of reaching the end of our time i really appreciate the look into uh the world of physics remote learning and that you know you've obviously had a pretty steep learning curve and a lot yeah. of work you put into this great platform you've come up with do you have any last tips tricks suggestions words of caution or words of wisdom for any folks you know kind of looking to go deeper into yeah. this remote learning support world in september well i think you know, one thing we didn't really talk about very much because we were short on time was just the communicating the communication with the kids, mm -hmm. and each teacher is going to figure out their own their own way of doing that best. Honestly, with the senior physics kids, they they mostly preferred email, which was quite hilarious. Mm -hmm. I, I thought they would want to set up Snapchat with me or something, <laughs> but no, it was it, they, they just liked email, and I got great questions through there um, or through the comment section in classroom. I asked them a couple times if they wanted to have a zoom meeting to go over and they didn't really want to, they, they were pretty happy to be, you know, a little more independent. Uh, certainly some kids struggled with that independence. Um, of course. And so I think just being really clear with the students at the beginning and, and having a, a frank discussion about, you know, the, the expectations and my, uh, my kids, when we talked, it was, it was really about just getting more learning done. Like we were just focused on, let's just learn some more stuff between you know, March and, and the end of May. And um, so that the marks and those kind of things weren't as important. And um, I, I think if you talk, you probably will, you'll, you'll hear around the district, there's, there's rumors of kids you know, paying other kids to do their homework or university students to take their tests. And of course, you can have this sort of abuse when, when you're doing a test at home. Yeah, I mean, we fully expected the kids to be texting one another or, or you know, Googling the answers or whatever. So just, just change the way you ask the questions. We went a lot deeper, a lot fewer questions in physics with a lot more um, explanation and written work behind it. Um, yeah, less of the knowledge based and more of the understanding and application end. Um, and that was great. And just and just telling the kids, you know, hey, look, your your marks are going to be okay. If you're, if you're participating, your marks are going to be okay. Let's not focus on the marks. Let's focus on just learning as much as we can before the end of the school year. And uh, yeah, they seem pretty receptive to that. So isn't that the beauty of this? So that's, you know, I've always been thinking that's the silver lining behind this whole experience yeah. it's really yeah. forcing us to focus on the learning. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're able to kind of pare down to those, you know, what are the key things you need to be successful in physics 12 to move on or just to feel like you've, you know, hit all those key targets. And um, yeah. So if there's anything we can take from away from this yeah. is, is it that maybe all that we were doing in the past and may not matter as much, but there's you know, yeah. four essential pieces that we were keeping able to pare down. Yeah, there were certainly some positives that came out of this. And that was another thing I tried to, I tried to focus on, on, on those positives as we went through this, this time. And the, and the neat thing was I was able to have some pretty, pretty frank discussion. Well, I'll put that in air quotes, discussions, usually via email yeah. um, with, with students that normally wouldn't have had a voice in class. Mm -hmm. So um, being a little bit of an extrovert myself, I, I really learned a lot from my introverts in the last couple of months. Some kids really started to shine because they, they had that, they didn't have that social pressure. They had, they could, could do things on their own time schedule. And uh, I could get a little chat going with them one-on-one -on -one through email and, and really learn more about them. 
Uh, whereas in class, you know, it tends to be the, the loud yeah. class clowns like me yeah. who, get, who get the teacher's attention. Um, and it's hard for the introverts. So that was, that was a, a, for me, that was a big takeaway. That was a big learning uh, for me. So. I, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat this morning. It's really interesting, really insightful, and um, I'm sure it's going to be of huge interest to other physics and science teachers around the district. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, I thank, I thanks, thanks, John. I, and I don't know um, why why my name popped up because I certainly didn't do anything uh, special. I think you know lo te teachers were doing all different things, but we were all just kind of doing our best, and uh, it, cra it was crazy and uh, weird. But um, like you say, there's positives that we can now take away and, and learn from and improve our practice, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, take care, John.